I'm going to be sharing with you from the book of Revelation as we continue to look at the seven churches and take verse by verse our way through the book of Revelation this year. We're on the church of Philadelphia this week and we are going to take and get your Bible ready. If you would please put it in hand and stand with me and Roy. We're ready, aren't we, buddy? You bet. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I'm open and ready to receive from God's living Word. You may be seated and open up to Revelation 3. So the husband, he's just thinking that, you know, they should be having a little more privacy in their homes because the, the kids have grown up and the kids have moved out. But one morning he says to his wife, Honey, your mother has been living with us now for 25 years years. The kids have moved out. Don't you think it's time for your mother to find her own place? And his wife's eyes got big. And she says, I thought she was your mother. <laughs> you may have to process that for a minute, I think. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And the, the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also will keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We are on church number six of the seven churches the Church of Philadelphia. It is there in what is now modern Turkey, but it was the province of Asia Minor during the time of John's writing the book of Revelation. The province of Asia Minor in the Roman Empire. And here on these seven churches on this Roman road, Jesus writes a letter to each church. We're now on the Church of Philadelphia. And this church of Philadelphia, Jesus addresses two huge issues, issues that relate to you, not just to them. He's going to personalize it for them. But he also wants to personalize it for you as well. Two big issues that you deal with. Rejection and fear. Those are things that everyone has to deal with in life. But when Jesus speaks into the life of this church, and as he wants to speak into your life, you see how deeply he cares. Now, issue number one for the church in Philadelphia was incredible fear due to earthquakes. We'll talk about that next week when we talk about fear. Issue number two was rejection from the synagogue. We'll talk about that rejection today. 
Now, the Jewish synagogue had made an official determination there in the city of Philadelphia. They had determined that Jesus was not going to be their Messiah. They said he was not the real Messiah. He was a pseudo-false prophet. And they were not going to allow the Christians, many of whom were Jews that were converted to Jewish Christians, believing Jesus was and is the Jewish Messiah, along with many Gentiles that had come to faith as well and were coming in and worshiping because they worshiped the one true God. But this Jewish synagogue had decided these Christians were not going to be welcome in the synagogue, and they closed the door to them. In their rejection, they would actually take them to the front door and say, this door is closed to you. You don't come in here ever again. You are not welcome here. They closed the door. Now that didn't just mean the loss of the opportunity to be together with people that they considered of like faith. This took them and it cost them their designation under the Roman Empire of religio licita, meaning a legitimate religion. The Roman Empire had determined you are only allowed to worship the gods of the empire. The only exception is if you have the special designation of an ancient religion. But when the Jewish synagogue there in Philippi said, you are not part of us. We don't recognize Jesus as genuine. They're saying you don't have any exemption to worship, and that opened up the church to incredible persecution. Now, that's one thing that rejection could do to them. But the other thing that rejection does is that rejection destroys relationships. And all of us, let's face it, we are relational as beings. God's created us for relationships. The, the creation of man, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. God created you for relationships, happy, healthy relationships. And when they kicked them out of the synagogue and closed the door to them, they were doing similar to what is even done today. They were declaring them, you are dead to us. In fact, even today in Orthodox Judaism, if a son or a daughter comes into relationship with Christ, becoming what they call a messianic Jew or a completed Jew, amongst the ultra-Orthodox, they will take and they will have a funeral. And they will say, our son who became a Christian, a Messianic Jew, he's dead to us. And they will bury an empty casket. And they will say, you're no longer part of our family. You do not contact us. You're out. We want nothing to do with you. Now that's harsh. And that's what this synagogue had done to the believers there. You're going to believe in this Jesus as Messiah? You're not going to believe with us. And they kicked him out. And now Jesus, when he writes to them, he writes so relevantly, like he always does, and he shares with them three titles that relate directly to their experience of being rejected and gives them reassurance. The church, remember now, the Christians are being persecuted by those of the synagogue who claim to worship Yahweh. 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 Yahweh is the actual Jewish name for God. 
It is based on the Hebrew tetragrammon, four consonants, Yahweh, Ha, Yahweh, Yahweh. These four consonants making up the holy name of God were not normally spoken. They were, they were reserved because they, you didn't want to take the Lord's name in vain. So they would instead say Adonai, which means Lord. But Yahweh was the holy name of God. Wherever you see in the Bible L-O-R-D, the word Lord, and it's all capital letters, that's because it's the Hebrew word Yahweh. And they wouldn't speak that. Now, the Jews say that they worship Yahweh. And the first thing that Jesus says is to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, he says, these things says he who is true. He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. He who is holy, he who is true, and he who has the key of David. The statement when he says, he who is holy. This is hochakias in Greek. It's using an article. The holy, not a holy. It's not describing like an indefinite article. It's just, it is identifying. Jesus says, the holy, the holy one. Jesus right here is actually calling himself the Holy One. And he is directly claiming, Jesus is directly claiming to be Yahweh God. Now you need to understand that in the Old Testament, this was one of the names for Yahweh God. One of the names that Yahweh called himself, he called himself the Holy One, HaKadosh. We see this in 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 20, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 25, Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 3. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One. He uses this as a way of identifying himself. And now Jesus, writing to the church in Philadelphia that has been kicked out of the synagogue, Jesus says, you don't have to worry about that. You have the real thing. You have Yahweh God yourself. You have the Holy One. Now the second title that he gives to them, to give them a reassurance, he also tells them the true one. This also is used in the articular in the Greek, meaning it is identifying, not describing, Jesus isn't just saying, I tell you the truth. That's not it. This is hoalithios. And he doesn't use the word acrobus. Acrobus would mean accurately for the word true. He uses the word here that means genuine. Jesus is saying, I am the true, the genuine one. They've been told by this synagogue that Jesus isn't the real Messiah. But Jesus definitely states, no, I am the genuine one, not a pseudo, not a counterfeit Messiah, as their former members of the synagogue told them. He says, I'm the holy one. I'm Yahweh God. I am I am the genuine Messiah. And this third title comes from messianic prophecy that we see in Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 22. And you, you can turn there if you'd like to with me. If you open your Bible to about the middle, you come to the book of Psalms. You take a right turn from Psalms, you come to Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and then the prophets begin with the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter number 22 and verse number 22, this is a messianic poem here. And it says, the key of the house of David, I will lay on his shoulder. Whose shoulder? The Messiah, the genuine one. 
the key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder so he shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. And what does Jesus say? He says, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Jesus is claiming to be Yahweh himself, the genuine Messiah, and the one who has the key of the house of David. Well, isn't that getting just a tad bit redundant? I mean, he's already told us he's a Messiah. Why reiterate that? Because there's something really important to these people who have been kicked out of the synagogue. In this Hebrew poetry, he announces, he reassures them, yes, I am the genuine Messiah, and I've got the keys. And the key of the house of David means I have the authority. I have the power as the Jewish Messiah. The keys of the house of David is a metaphor, a figure of speech to say, I have complete control over who's coming in, who's going out in the royal household. And he's telling these believers who have been rejected by the people around them, I'm giving you entrance into a new door that no one can shut to you. You're coming into the new Jerusalem, into my kingdom, into the future blessings that are going to be beyond belief. Well, we're going to see more about this next week as we chat about it. But understand that the synagogue closed the door on these believers, but Jesus opened a door for them that no one could possibly shut. And now, I want to pour some encouragement into your life because you need it. You need what Jesus was giving to them. And this is for you today too. He goes on in the next verse as he does with all the letters and says, I know. And you need to know that Jesus knows what's going on in your life. You need to know that he knows everything about you. That freaked me out when I first realized it. Everything about me? He sees everything that I do? He knows every thought? Oh, man, he's not going to like me. He knows everything about you. And here's the mind-blowing part. He still loves you just the way you are. That's mind-blowing. God loves you just the way you are. Even the way I... Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jesus can be. And Jesus desires to be. Everything that you need in the crisis that you are facing in life. And that includes the crisis of rejection. Now every single person experiences rejection. You know what it's like to have people reject you. People to push you away, think little of you, mock you, belittle you. Exclude you in life. You know what rejection feels like. Why do people do that? I mean, it's so, it's so ungodly. Because they are rejected themselves, and rejected people reject. Hurt people hurt people. People who are hurt hurt others. Hurt people hurt people. Rejected people reject people. And when you see somebody who's ostracizing and rejecting, know this, they are most likely struggling with rejection in their life. And then there are other people, some people who reject because they want to control you. Think of cancel culture. You either accept what we do, what we think, what we believe, or we cancel you. And some people reject because they want to make themselves appear better than other people. They think if they belittle you and put you down, somehow it makes them better. They think they're higher, but what they've done really lowers them. 
It's sad when people reject. It's sad that people live with that. Because rejection leaves people with feelings of jealousy and loneliness and shame and guilt and social anxiety and embarrassment. Rejection, the experience of rejection, creates powerful primary emotional responses in your life. And if you think back to some of those experiences of when you experienced rejection from someone, some of these primary emotions not only came about, but may still be dwelling in the background. And Jesus wants to heal you just like he was speaking into the church at Philadelphia, he wants to speak healing into your life as well. Now, cancel culture corrupts the distinction between acceptance and approval. The world is so immature, and it wrongly asserts, you know, you... you, you you don't agree with our agenda in the sex that we're pushing. That means you're, you're a hater or you're phobic. If you don't agree with the trans agenda is the biggest one today, you must be transphobic or a trans hater. No, not at all. In fact, I am a trans lover. What? Yeah. I love those people, and my heart breaks and hurts deeply because they are experiencing pain so deep within their lives. They think that they are created wrong. They think that God made a mistake with them. No, God didn't make a mistake. God made them. In the very beginning, God created them, male and female. They are a beautiful, divine creation of God. God didn't make a mistake. They don't need to change who they are to something God didn't make them to be. They need to come and get healed on the inside. And let me tell you, the depth of confusion that people are going through when they come to that place of such Dysphoria and confusion, the hurt is so deep. Mocking them is wrong. Our hearts should break for them, for the pain that they're going through, for the confusion they're experiencing. They need Jesus to love them, to heal them of their rejection, of their brokenness, and let's face it, all of us are broken. All of us need Jesus. We need God to speak into our lives, every single human, to realize the beauty of his creation and to come to a place of transformation. Rick Warren puts it this way. Our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. We need to pour out the compassion, the love of Christ into the lives of every broken person. We need to have Jesus, the one who loves and addresses the deepest needs of our lives to come and speak the healing that changes the core of who we are. We need that. God's loving acceptance as we are is what empowers us to change into who we should be. 
You see, he loves you just the way you are, but he loves you so much, he's not going to leave you that way. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah. I don't have time for this verse. We'll touch it maybe next week. The next week we need to continue, and, and I'm going to show you how mind-blowingly God affirms you and wants to speak healing into the areas of rejection in your life and wants to destroy fear that would control your life. God wants to destroy rejection. I'm going to ask the deacons, deaconesses, to distribute communion, if you would, please. And at all the other campuses, please distribute communion at this moment as well as we get ready to share this together. We shared a passage from Isaiah about Jesus as Messiah. There's another passage in Isaiah that speaks about Jesus being rejected. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him. Dear ones, when Jesus went to the cross, he was despised and rejected of men. He went to that cross to take your rejection, to have poured out on him the chastisement so that you could have peace within your life to restore you and I into a right relationship with God. Not, not, not to bring about religion. It's about a relationship, not religion. It's the relationship with Jesus, being restored to God who loves you just the way you are and loves you so much he won't leave you that way. The God who can take you just the way you are, forgive you for all that's been in the past, to give you right here, right now, a brand new life and a new start. And what an amazing future to bless you, to bless your life. As we share this communion, Jesus did similarly, of course, with his disciples. On that Passover, he took the bread, and you can open up the top, cellophane, get that wafer of bread out, an unleavened bread. Jesus said, this, this bread represents my body, which will be broken for you. You know what it's like to be rejected. You know how it can leave you feeling broken. Jesus said, I'm going to be broken for you to heal the rejection, to heal the brokenness. Lord Jesus, only because of your grace can we experience the healing that we really need in the depths of our lives. As we share this moment, we invite you to come and be the healer. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a few moments? We are going to pray a very special communion prayer to surrender our rejection to the one who was rejected for us. Would you pray right out loud and say, Dear Jesus, you were despised and rejected of men. You were rejected for me. You understand all the pain I've gone through, the hurts of my past, the things people have done to me, the mistakes I have made, 
the sins I've committed. I'm sorry, Jesus. Please forgive me. I want your healing in the deepest places of my life. I want you to transform me into the person you want me to be, to heal me, to renew me, to fill me with your Holy Spirit, to make my life all you want it to be. I surrender to you my heart and my life. I am yours, Lord Jesus. Let's partake of the bread together. Jesus took the cup. And said this cup represents a new covenant new relationship in my blood. Because he cares about your relationship with him and with others. He was willing to put his own blood on the line. The Old Testament tells us that life is in the blood. And Jesus is giving his life for you to give you a new life, his life. None of you, hear me strong, none of you are a mistake. You are not a mistake. You are a creation of Almighty God. You are divinely created in his image. You are beautiful and precious. And he has given everything to have a relationship with you. As we share this covenant, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for your life. We thank you for your love. Let's partake of the cup together. Wow. Stand with me, my dear ones. I want you to hear something deeper in your spirit than perhaps you allow things to normally go. When I speak to you, you know I speak to you from his word. And I hope you open your heart and you will open your heart to hear this. You are not a reject. Do you hear me? Yeah. I'm speaking it loud and strong because I want you to hear it in the depths of your spirit. You are not a reject. Do you hear me? You are a divine creation of Almighty God. And you are a treasure. And Ephesians 4.10 says you are a masterpiece of God. A masterpiece, not a mistake. Ephesians 2.10 says you are not a mistake. You are a masterpiece. And I pray, Father, over every one of these men and women that in the depths, the core of their lives, they will receive this truth and that you will bring a healing like only you can do. I, I can't do it, but I know in the power of your Holy Spirit, you can heal places that are so deep. Bless them, Father. Holy Spirit, have your way. Bring them healing. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, heal. Heal, heal, in Jesus' name, amen.
I love you. Do you hear me? My dear ones, I love you. And next Sunday, we'll continue. I'm going to put some more encouragement in your heart, and I'm going to ask men, lead the way to church. It's Father's Day next Sunday. You be the men of God. You lead the way to church. We got some great things for you. God bless you. You are dismissed. Online family, we will see you this Thursday night. God bless you.